Hey, how's it going, you beautiful people? Uh, my name is Spencer Simmons, a local Scottsdale painter and artist. Uh, and this video really just aims to flip the camera around, go through that materials list. This is really going to be kind of a partner with it, the material list that should be on the website for the November 2021 workshops. Uh, they'll be on Thursdays from 1 to 4, I believe 3 Thursdays. And I just thought it'd be really cool to just walk through the pieces of my kit um, that, you know, I've been using for the past four years or so, just this particular uh, variation of it, uh, and and talk about it a little bit and just give you some food for thought. You know, sometimes those materialists seem to be pretty cut and dry, pretty black and white, and I wish over the years that I'd had instructors that were able to put some video content out and actually to hear them talk, to put a face to the name, so here's my opportunity to do that. Thank you, you magical, beautiful people working at Scott Slaughter School that put all this together. And uh, yeah, so let's flip the camera around, check out the stuff, and I'll see you at the workshop. All right, so the first part of the kit is the bag. So this is an Osprey uh, Talon 22 liter bag. It's uh, a really light uh, relative. I mean, you can see from the scale of my hands or this eight by 10 sketchbook. Um, it's a pretty like medium small bag, but it's built really well. And it has this nice kind of um, light frame in it. It's like hardly anything uh, rigid plastic, but it, you know, a bag like this is great. Um, you know, this, this is, you know, even has the, the hip, the hip straps, which I don't really use that often to be honest with you. Maybe uh, if I'm spending a long day in Europe, this is great to have, um, especially if you're hiking around the hills or something. But, um, you know, you uh, something uh, a little bit lighter, something uh, so that you can fit your whole kit in. It's going to vary from person to person, um, you know, uh, as far as what kind of weight you're trying to trek around. Um, if it's mostly just stuff that you're going to be, um, if it's mostly just paintings that you're going to be doing close to the house or around town, mostly you're probably just going to pull stuff out of your car or carry around on a bicycle, so it's not going to be as important. This is going to be for those people who are doing a reasonable amount of traveling and, you know, perhaps are thinking about paring the kit down to uh, get on, you know, fit on a plane easily, uh, wherever you're going, throw on the bag, and you can walk. So this is what this kit is kind of geared toward. You by no means need that. Bring out the super chunky French easel, whatever the stuff we're going to be painting in november um will be outdoors it is very advisable that you pare your kit down because it makes painting more fun you know i think the less steps you have in the way of actually getting in the car or walking outside of your apartment or house or wherever you are and just set it up as quickly as you can and paint, you know, paint the subject, paint the light effects. That's what we're getting after. Right. Um, so that's really one of the, the biggest reasons for having a lighter kit or having a simpler painting kit. Um, so yeah, we're just going to move along and the next item will be, uh, I guess we can do the sketchbook. Um, this isn't going to be a necessity. I don't think we'll be doing a ton of um, sketching on location with sketchbooks. But, you know, for me, I take these everywhere. I mean, these are these are my journals. These are studies for a large... Um, study for a large studio painting. Sketches while I, I'm passenger driving... Um, you know, we sketch people, dogs, items, funerals, anything and everything. My own feet, your best subject, cafes, you know, these are, this is the kind of stuff you need is to just always be drawing. Uh, this is really, I mean, the stuff that we won't have time to really, uh, go over and, and this is, <laughs> this is, the biggest battle for anyone who wants to paint and draw representationally is is really 
going and bringing that sketchbook everywhere. See these little figures at a cafe, and, um, you know, a lemon tree, more figures at a bar. I mean, you know, the watch, little statues, you know, this kind of stuff really pushed me to, to my next level of proficiency. It's just always filling sketchbooks, trying to make the drawings as good as you can. Um, but they're, they're a record of your life. It's uh, a learning tool and, and something that I take great pleasure in. This one happens to be a Stillman and Burn. Stillman and Burn Zeta series. It's the 8x10. I use the smaller ones forever. Um, and those are a great option. I just like the slightly larger format. And this the Zeta one's really nice because you can actually... The, the, even the lighter ones, um, I switched over to the soft cover because they're way lighter than the the hard hardbound ones you, know, you lose a few pages but the you know it's like half the weight and the zeta series um it has the heavier paper in there so i mean you can just do watercolors all day there's no buckling and i will even say the lighter pound paper um sketchbooks uh they don't buckle as well i mean they, they don't like this they, they lay flat and they don't buckle so go to sketchbooks definitely still gonna burn amazing Okay, so the next item is going to be, uh, let's say the easel. Let's go into that. So I use a, a tripod-based uh, easel system, and this is a Siru. Siru, can you see that? I'm not sure. Siru tripod, and it is the, right there, you can see that. It's the T-005KX. And this is a fantastic little tripod. I mean, I think it is the ruler out here. It is only about 12 inches folded up. So it's very compact. And I'm about six feet tall. And for me, this thing will unfold. Just really simple. You, you can twist these. Deploy super quickly. Um, and I can be painting in, in a minute or two, depending on, or more, depending on, on the circumstance, but, um, and we'll go into also some other things. So I, like I said, I used a tripod for my painting. Now you could totally use a French easel or what other, whatever other setups you have, um, as long as it is a portable system because we are going to be painting outside and you're going to want to make this as easy as you can on yourself. Um, so uh, my two big recommend, and so French easel is always a go-to. The half box ones are really cool because they're like slightly lighter, uh, but the full one's totally fine. Um, so any camera tripod is going to be totally fine. You know, if you, especially if you fit it in a big tote or something like that, um, it should work beautifully. You know, don't you don't have to go spend a fortune on on materials for this class. I mean, you really don't. You know, the idea is to make it accessible and and to use what you can. But we're I'm just showing you what I have, and I would recommend trying to pare down your kit to as few items as you can, so you can have a better time. What we have on the right here is the uh, is a easel mast that I built. I don't know, three and a half years ago or something like that. Four years ago, and it was based on. Um, Mark D'Alessio, an amazing landscape painter, he had had something similar he was building for his plein air setup. And he, uh, I'm not sure if he took the idea from Joshua Bean, who makes his, um, makes amazing tripod and oil painting setups and the, and an easel mask like this, that's similar. It's all black, a lot more professional than this. Uh, I made one for my fiance that's way nicer than these and a bigger one as well. But I'm going to be making probably five or six of these and uh, they will be for sale so that you can use them for the class. And there'll be more information on that. You can email me, um, thespencersimmons at gmail.com. But this is a cool, I mean, it's a just uh, cool easel mask I made for myself. This holds a little shade screen which maybe I'll bring out, but you know, I put my, my watercolor board in here. This holds up to about like 12 by 16 
or a oil a lot of oil painting these days but i put that in there and i tighten it up it's good to go i've got this little connector here which uh is for my oil painting box and then this is a little tripod mount that just fits real easily i feel kind of a little inept doing this on this uh on this quick release tripod setup slides in tighten that up and uh unscrew this and obviously you have to have a little imagination here but that is and i'll, I'll take some video or take some photos but the, then it hooks up super easily super beautiful and you're painting within seconds and then it collapses just as easy so that's the benefit of the tripod system and all this fits in a backpack super lightweight super easy let's move on um i suppose also if we're going to be talking about the the uh, easel setup we can move into the shelf that i kind of consider a staple now in the uh planner setup and i it's super another again i made this to be really compact it's nine and a half by 14 um really thin spray i mean you can see it's been used thoroughly over the past uh four years or so three and a half years and i just made this i you know i thought to myself why is there not something on the market i still haven't seen anything that doesn't have a a bar clamp like one would see on a, a microphone stand or, or a camera tripod that can clamp anywhere on that vertical bar and hold my stuff. And this amazing little clamp, it's called a small rig. I don't know, probably made in China or some smut. And it works beautifully. I mean, there's like no bow in it when you, and you can load this thing up you know, put it up high on your tripod. And then you have the super portable shelf. A lot of the ones that are on the market slide on and they're really low. I hate bending over to mix my paints or anything like that. So this is essential. Um, again, I'll probably make some of these that look obviously way nicer. And yeah, so for oil painting and watercolor, I mean, it fits my palette and my, my stuff and maybe even a drink, you know, a spray bottle, pencils, everything super super simply um and effectively so this is a must i can't even recommend anything else uh, out there because i just would never use it but some of these will be available as well um if you if you don't have like a french easel that has a platform or some other system there's plenty that do have shelves that slide so anyways on and upwards that's basically the easel setup so those three pieces make the easel and I guess we can just leave this here and uh, can be our platform. Here, uh, we'll go into watercolor paints and uh, palette. Here is my handmade German nickel um, House of Hoffman palette. I bought this, I think, in 20... I want to say 2015, 2014. They're quite a bit more expensive now. Um... They're amazing, you know, I made this case for it. Uh, just a leather case. Uh, this is the small, it's not small, it's a good size. A crazy amount of mixing space. Um, and I had him do this custom insert here in the middle. He's, he's a great guy, Steve. Um, again, not a necessity to have like this really Gucci setup uh, for watercolor. I mean, there's so many plastic palettes out there. It'll make you, you know, dizzy. So any one of them will be great as long as it's like a decent size mixing space. I mean, you can see I've got pretty large hands. I'm not sure what the size of this thing is folded out, but it's like 11 by 10 and a half or something, 11 by 11. Um, so yeah, watercolor palette, essential. I love the metal ones because I love that enamel surface to mix on. It, it's really just beautiful. Um, and when you're trying to make beautiful things and things that inspire you, metal palettes help. Uh, brass, you know, there's plenty of the whole bind ones that are beautiful, nice enamel surfaces that really don't cost an arm and a leg. But anyways, let's get on to the colors, the tubes. Uh, I use mostly tube paints, it's the, seemingly the most economical um, 
And when you paint a lot, it makes sense. Especially when you want to use good quality paints. And the, and the, the half pans really, the half and whole pans don't really make a ton of sense. Because um, they're a little bit harder to re-wet. And, the, you know, these are just as good. So, I use a variety of brands. I've tried everything. I worked at, at Blick for a number of years. And I've tried everything under the sun. And my biggest thing on buying paints is always really good quality. I try to buy American-made stuff paints that's kind of my goal there's obviously stuff that i i really love and tons of paint i have to go through before i can completely uh you know use up all of my other paints but what we have here is uh ultramarine blue um i can't even remember what brand this i think it might be daniel smith i'm not 100 percent sure uh cobalt blue this is, I'm almost definitely is uh, M. Graham. Very sticky. They're great paints. They're an amazing company. Their oils are amazing. They use a lot of honey. So those those paints are exceptionally easy to re-wet. I mean, it's super pigmented, amazing paints. The next one, Cerulean. Um, I've kind of cut this one out of my oil painting because I found that I could use the cobalt instead. But for watercolor, everything it's such a the biggest it's such a temptation because you the paints never really go bad right so that you just put them on your palette you load the palette up and pretty soon you've got like 30 colors and you've only you only use eight or ten so mine is very pared down i use a very limited palette um and i hit the full spectrum of colors and i i'm you know after painting for years and years and years this is my selection of colors i'm very comfortable painting anything I can possibly encounter in these, uh, with these pigments. Um, so ultramarine blue, sometimes I use ultramarine blue deep, French ultramarine, they're all good. Cobalt blue, cerulean blue. This is a, this, it, I, my favorite green is most certainly viridian green. I mean, I love that, that pigment, you know, um, Sargent used a ton of it. It's just a beautiful green. Um, and this is not that I found that a lot of the viridians I was using in watercolor, in fact, for some reason across the board, really just dried very hard, very crumbly, um, and weren't, wasn't that satisfying. So this is actually cobalt turquoise, uh, by Windsor Newton. It's, and it's very green. It's very similar, a little bit more opaque than Viridian. Uh, but I've also, but recently I kind of discovered that I'm using the Viridian. I just have to burn through this. So Viridian is my go-to, but, uh, Cobalt Turquoise will work as well. Below that, Cadmium Lemon Yellow. And this is a gorgeous, um, I, I love that cool, bright, you know, offensive yellow. It's amazing. And those, the kind of intense greens that you can get with, uh, these three, three colors, the uh, Viridian or Cobalt Turquoise with that, that, um, Cadmium Lemon is, is fantastic. And I love that it's a little opaque. Um, you know, a lot of these colors are pretty opaque to be honest with you. Um, the next one is a Cadmium Yellow Medium. Uh, and you could use ca cadmium yellow light, uh, even if that was the only one you could get, that would be fine. Um, I just like to have that variety. I mean, honestly, you could reduce this palette even farther. Um, but I'm not gonna, so how about that? Uh, cadmium yellow medium, yellow ochre, absolutely essential. This is M. Graham as well. These two are, uh, yeah. And this is Permanent Rose from Windsor Newton. It's really just PV19, which is a quinacridone uh, red. And that's just a really nice, super bright, uh, modern, cool red. And I think that's super important to have um, embrace the modern pigments and go for that quinacridone because for, for your cool red. Because in watercolor and oil paint, Everything, reds become muddy. Cad red, cad red light, cad orange, cad yellows, and all the alizarins, um, all the lake pigments, they just go muddy, muddy uh, as soon as you add 
white or you add, start mixing around. So you always have high expectations for a high cro chroma color and you'll never hit it. So I always, um, but with an added quinacridone color, you can really make a jump to hitting those higher chroma colors as well as getting a more modern yellow. Um, but I like the cadmium, so I'm gonna stick with those. Next one, cad red. This is a medium. Um, I wouldn't, I, I never use cadmium red deep, but cad, cadmium red medium or light or your, would be what I would suggest. Um, and then burnt umber. Uh, I don't use burnt sienna, totally amazing color, and all the other earth colors, I just feel like you can get totally lost in them uh, and, and have fun getting lost in them. I'm, I've made up my mind, and I'm going to stay with these for now, and I can mix anything I want. I use brown a lot just for making blacks and grays and muddying colors. Anyways, we'll go over all that. That's the layout. Bring something that's similar or the same. High quality paints if you can. Uh, I mean, that's really the only way to go is artist quality paints. Um, if you have any questions, again, you send me an email. So that's the watercolor palette and paints. I guess we will move on to brushes. So a goofy little case. Um, again, I worked at a triathlon store for years and this was a cool, you can still buy these, they're not much, 10, 10 15 bucks, I think. Um, and these are just a water bottle that is a container for you uh, if you're riding a bicycle or whatever, and you can slide that in your on your bicycle frame. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be a great thing to use for holding watercolor brushes? Because the top can be used as my water cup. So yeah. <laughs> Fold that in half, uh, pretty good. I mean, some of the brushes you might have to cut down. Again, not necessary. There's plenty of foldable water cups, yogurt container, it's really not important, whatever. Um, now, I always have an aggressive amount. I mean, you can see there's probably like 30 brushes here. Um, I always have an aggressive amount of brushes. You do not need this many. Um, usually I have, you know, brushes here. I'm just gonna fold them out a little bit so you can see what we are using. Uh, something I will suggest if, you know, I don't really use flat brushes at all. There's, I got one, I think maybe two, and they really come out to play. Um, so most, pretty much everything that I use in watercolor is round brushes. I think it's the most versatile and basically all of these are, uh, Rosemary and Co., which, you know, you go to Scott Seller School, you'll know them. Not a necessity. Um, you know, they're just great brushes at a really reasonable prices. Um, so I love squirrel mops, much like I would um, hog bristle brushes for oil painting. They are a workhorse. Uh, tons of water, tons of pigment. They come to nice points, and you can cover and do a crazy amount of different effects with them. So I would suggest if you could get, uh, if you could, if you could find it in your budget, if you don't already have them, getting a decent sized mop and a slightly smaller one. Rosemary and Co. offers these gorgeous little teeny ones, which I absolutely love, a 10 zero, and this is a six. So, I mean, if you could get a 10 zero and a six, you will be money, money. I mean, this is, you will be totally going for it. I've got all kinds of, I mean, for big, I do full sheet paintings out on location all the time. Uh, this, these are a Skoda, that's a zero, uh, beautiful, beautiful points. So if you could get a couple and if you're a vegan or you, or you don't like natural hair brushes, there are plenty of great options out there on the market for synthetic brushes. Um, I think it's the Princeton Neptune, um, or the, there's also another one, uh, I think is it silver brush company that makes the black velvet ones. Anyways, uh, and also Trickel, um, out of California, they make synthetic squirrel hair mops. So pick your poison, whatever you want. I just prefer round and, uh, the real thing, but they're, they're a little pricey. If you can't afford it, no sweat. 
um, get the synthetic alternative uh, and you'll be fine. Just grab, make sure you have a few sizes in those. Um, next is whether it's going to be, uh, my go-to favorite for watercolor is going to be natural hairbrushes in general. And they come to beautiful points. And this is a number six Klinsky from Rosemary and Carrie. And I, and I get it. Most people, you know, it's not a priority to spend money like that on brushes. There's a beautiful feel, a release of the water, a snap of the brush um, that natural Kalinsky and just regular Sable have. And if you could afford it, I'd get something like a number 10, um, a number, you know, a number six. I mean, you could get away with all if it's a nice brush you can do all your detail with a nice number six a number 10 and you know a number uh a number 12 or something something slightly bigger uh this is a big well this is 18 or 20 um you know not not, not so you can get away with those three like a 10 uh like even a 10 a six and and uh, a four or something like that you'd be totally fine if you have those two nice mops to deal with. I have a bunch of teeny ones as well, just for doing extra, you know, extra, I'm very, I mean, you'll see, I, I do some pretty detailed marks and telephone lines. So that's what I use for brushes. Take your pick out there. There's too many to choose from. So that's brushes. Um, next is just going to be kind of the, the finicky stuff. Mechanical pencils are really a beautiful thing for watercolor um paintings seeing as a lot of the marks we make are, are very much contour lines and if it's outdoors you probably don't have a ton of time so not having to sharpen is beautiful this is just a cheapy pentel zero point uh, seven this is a point seven point five are great those are my two go-to's hb or 2b lead you know or classic office pencil, as long as you have a pencil sharpener. Those are absolutely gorgeous to do all of your work for, with, especially because they all have erasers built on. Um, you know, kneaded erasers are, are a beautiful plus. Um, and as far as the other little knickknacks that I absolutely love to have is uh, white gouache or, you know permanent white watercolor, whatever. This is M. Graham. It's nice because it's a bit stickier than the others. It stays wetter longer. And I find this to be a necessity. I mean, yeah, one needs gouache. You can do so much fun, fun, fun things with adding some white to your paintings. Um, and a spray bottle. This is just came from Italy. I've had it for years. It's a little cheap, like medical. I can't even remember. It was some kind of ointment spray. I just sent it out, put water in here. But, you know, you spray your paints with it and your, your paper. That's a necessity. Um, a pencil pouch of some kind is nice to have. Whatever. You could use a Ziploc bag. It really doesn't matter. Um, a portfolio is nice to have um, to keep some paper. This is a portfolio I made uh, for quarter sheets primarily. And we can talk about paper. You know, paper is, is as important as everything you're using. I prefer tremendously just 100% cotton rag paper. Um, it's just unparalleled for what you get out of it. It's a necessity. Um, you can make cool paintings on everything, but this is my go-to. The cold press is beautiful. It allows you to do so many things. Not a big rough paper guy. Um, or, you know, use hot press from time to time, but you really can't get the same effects as you can on, on a cold press paper. You really just can't. A lot of runoff. We'll talk about that. But this is actually, uh, Saunders, um, Saunders cold press. This is a really popular paper. I mean, I have hardly used this. My go-to is Fabriano 140 pound natural white gorgeous Italian paper or arch or arches, 140 pound cold press as well. 
those are my two go-tos for everything. Um, of course, I have like a ton of 300 pound arches paper. Everything's, you try it all, but those, those are what we're gonna be using for the class. So I'd say if you brought, if you bought just one sheet, um, preferably two, just as some backups and just cut it into quarters. This is 11 by 14 inches. And you know, for like, you know, uh, 15, 20 bucks, you'll have eight paintings um, and you can always flip the thing over in a worst case scenario and use it. Um, so yeah, that's paper. Let me put this away without bombarding the camera. And then a drawing board of some kind is gonna be essential for, let me see if I have that. actual drop my drawing board it must be in the car this is just a cheap hardboard panel but you could always use something like this um obviously a little bit bigger since we're working on 11 by 14 inch pieces uh for the workshop so uh you know go buy a panel go uh, i'm using a corrugated plastic which you can get at ace you can get at uh you know home depot Jerry's Artorama, Arizona Art Supply, Blick, they're going to sell that. It's very cheap. You can get a pretty meaningful, uh, big piece for like six bucks or something like that, six to ten dollars. And you can cut that down and, and it's lightweight, weighs nothing, and um, really is a necessity. You know I mean, you got to be able to tape your stuff down. And yeah, so the final thing is just going to be a, a tape. Um, you know, I don't actually have, <laughs> everything's in the car. This wasn't as well thought out as I thought it would be. Bless my sweetheart. Anyways, the, yeah, just some, some, uh, some painter's tape. Obviously you've probably had experience with, uh, with taping your paper down, but, uh, painter's tape, you know, inch, uh, two inch might be a little bit big, but go for a two inch if you want, whatever. And, uh, you know, scotch, frog tape, all that stuff's good, so. You don't have to spend a fortune, just make sure you come prepared. I'll bring some extra stuff just in case people forget. But anyways, I look forward to seeing everyone at the workshop. And I hope we have a great time painting. And I hope you've found this video somewhat informative on what we're going to, you know, as far as materials, what you need. And I can't wait to see you all. And have a magical rest of your day. Bye.